Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Alkara Guram. I am moderating this panel of very inspiring innovators in who are doing remarkable work in bringing technology to field of agriculture. And our guests are Shashank Kumar. Shashank is, has developed a mobile technology called Dehat. It works to provide end-to-end -end services to small and marginal farmers at affordable costs in India. The second panelist is Alvaro Ramirez. Alvaro is the founder of eHarvest Hub, a set of tools that connect small farmers to retail buyers and carriers. Then we have Sanjay Kadaveru, who, Sanjay is the founder of and president of Action for India. AFI is an initiative that helps social innovators in India overcome barriers to scale and achieve greater impact at the bottom of the pyramid. Then our last guest is uh, Ruchit Garg. Ruchit is the founder and CEO of Harvesting a company focused on addressing challenges in agriculture space using data science. Uh, I would like to invite each of the guests to speak a little more about their ventures and elaborate on what the introduction. Thank you. Well, starting with Shashank, yeah. We go this way and then we come back this way. <laughs> Thanks, Elka, for the introduction. Uh, very good morning to all of you. So, we work very closely with uh, small farmers in India. Uh, so, in India, close to 80% farmers are small who have close to, I mean, less than one hectare of, you know, land holding. And uh, they don't have access to, being a small farmer, they don't have access to accessible and affordable agri value chain services for their various agricultural requirement like agri-inputs, advisory information, market linkage of their agri-produce. And on top of everything, again, being a small farmer, they have to rely on multiple channels for their you know, various agricultural requirement. So we have built a technology called Dehat, which is a farmer's marketplace. And it connects these small farmers to their 360 degree of you know, agricultural requirements, right from which crop to grow, you know, how to grow, where to sell, it also connects them to the best source of input. They also look for the, you know, customized advisory uh, for their crop. They can also sell their farm produce directly to the institutional buyers. So we've been doing this since past four and a half years. It all started, you know, from meeting uh, every individual, you know, farmer on one-on-one -on -one basis. And then over the years, basically it transformed into a technology. And uh, so today, close to 10,200 farmers uh, directly we are serving by using our technology. Close to 24,000 uh, acres of farm area we are monitoring for our farmers, uh, delivering more than 50,000 uh, orders directly from farmers. We are present in three states of India, Bihar, Odisha, UP. Recently, we have also launched our services in, in Nepal. And, uh, we strongly believe that you know that that the technology we have built, which has you know all the you know ground level realities you know embedded, uh, it's it's pretty relevant for you know all type of small farmers, be it for uh, South Asia or East Africa, and uh, so as you know in fact uh, we have a very ambitious uh, you know uh, approach and target to have you know more than 300,000 farmers in the next you know couple of years. Uh, across the globe. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, my name is Alvaro Ramirez, and uh, th thanks for having me. Uh, what we do at eHarvest Hub is, is, is actually pretty simple. Uh, we connect small farmers, small and mid-sized farmers, directly with retailers and independent truckers. Uh, and what basically what we do is take all the clutterness out of the supply chain in the U.S. because uh, our food typically will zigzag seven to ten times before it makes it to the retailer's warehouse. So you probably heard that our food typically travels about 1,300 miles on average, and that's even within California. Uh, and we grow 60% of fresh produce uh, for the U.S. 
Um, and that's just because there's the clutterness of middlemen that cause that product to zigzag and make, make it expensive. What would make, what was interesting about that is that a farmer will typically make a 4% profit margin when they make a profit, which is not always the case. And um, we wanted to solve that. And we looked at this as, you know, as a company, instead of building a product. So in the earlier panel, somebody was talking about you build technology and you're trying to find an application for it. Um, we looked at it more of if we, can aim, if we can put the value back on that farmer, uh, that farmer can make different decisions about what they do, uh, especially when you're talking about a conventional farmer that uses a lot of chemicals to grow their product. Uh, to, for them to become sustainable, it's, it's pretty hard when you, your profit margin is less than 4% because uh, it takes time and money to convert your land uh, to, to be more sustainable or organic. So we wanted to solve that. And um, even our business model is based strictly on making sure that that farmer keeps most of that profit that he would make uh, going directly to a retailer or an institutional buyer like a Google or Facebook um, because we want to make sure that we make that change at the very beginning. Uh, and that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am Sanjay Kadaveru. I run an organization called Action for India. Uh, you're all here at Thai, so you know what Thai does. Thai is a platform. It's a global platform for fostering entrepreneurship, mentoring entrepreneurs. So what, what Thai does for commercial entrepreneurs globally, Action for India does for social innovators in India. So we are a similar platform for fostering social innovation, entrepreneurship, and mentoring social entrepreneurs. Uh, one of the things that we do every year is identify five leading social entrepreneurs from India and get them here to uh, Silicon Valley for a couple of weeks to give them exposure to the Silicon Valley innovation ecosystem. Shashank, whom you just heard from, is one of our group of five entrepreneurs that we bought here this time. And the whole intent is that even a brief exposure to the Valley's innovation ecosystem would enable these entrepreneurs when they go back to India to build better organizations or help refine their business models. That's the broad context of what I do. Uh, the work, uh, unlike the other three panelists who are working on specific enterprises, Action for India is a platform, is an ecosystem enabler. And we are more of a uh, macro player, uh, playing a role in uh, terms of policy implementation or in terms of wider dissemination of existing innovations. I want to give you one specific example. Uh, you must, if you've been following news in India, you must be all be aware of the widespread drought in western and southern parts of India, Maharashtra, northern Karnataka, Telangana, been, uh, this has been one of the worst droughted areas in several, several years. There's been uh, one uh, taluk uh, in Dharwa district in Karnataka, which, are, which has somehow managed to kind of face this drought in a much a, a better manner. And the innovation there was uh, something called a farm pond. Uh, not high tech, so you basically use part of the farm to uh, uh, yeah, store, uh, capture rain harvesting water and use the water to uh, uh, use it for uh, irrigating your crops uh, in a time like this. About 20 villages in this one district, in the Valgun Taluk in Darwa district, they had invested in this uh, uh, innovation uh, and this innovation was actually initially started by the Deshpande Foundation in the Hubli district. And uh, the way this innovation kind of started, initially it was in the grant model. So uh, in the spirit of doing good, uh, the foundation was uh, giving grants to these farmers to construct these ponds. For whatever reason, that didn't propagate and uh, either the, it was the ponds were not started or if they began, the rain harvesting was not in a proper manner and so forth. So quickly they pivoted to a model in which the farmers had to contribute a significant portion of the cost of the pond uh, themselves. And this led uh, to uh, a more wider uh, yeah, a practice adoption by the farmers. And there was an uh, element of business and uh, civil society collaboration. The Tata Trust were brought in uh, to kind of contribute equipment, the earth moving equipment to do this ponds. Initially, they gave about four earth movers. Today, they have about 20 earth movers in several districts of Karnataka. And they have a target of doing about 500 ponds in that region. And Action for India is working with the Deshpande Foundation to uh, the work that's been done in Hubli, we're trying to propagate that work in different parts of the country. So we've got similar regional hubs in places like Nizambad, Telangana, Varanasi, Uttar Pradesh, Bhubaneswar, Odisha, Raigad, Maharashtra. So the farm pond initiative that began in northern Karnataka is now migrated to Nizambad, Telangana. And uh, the best practice that uh, took root in one part of the country is now propagating to another part of the country. So that's the role that we are trying to play in terms of getting this good practices disseminated to a much wider audience. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Rochet and I'm founder CEO of a company called Harvesting. Uh, our focus is to provide uh, 
crop insurance and loans instrument to the farmers in the emerging world. And before I go a little bit more about the problem, I, I want us to kind of help, help you guys visualize the problem here. Assume we make $100,000 a year and you have all of it on front of you and $5 bill. And now you go out and then spread that out on your field and then let it out there for a year or six months. And just, and, and just think about that, you know, after six months, you will be how much money you will be able to bring back into your you know, lockers or what, what you got there. So uh, I, I hope that you kind of, uh, you can make a you know, visualization there that that's the exact extent the kind of problem farmers face today. If you specifically talk about India, we have hundreds of millions of farmers uh, who do not have access to financial instrument, uh, instruments like uh, crop loans and um, uh, insurance. And that's happening because of uh, unavailability of the data. There is data which is not flowing or flowing which is at very, very, uh, very uh, uh, slow pace. So at harvesting, we are using some very cutting edge technologies like applying deep learning to satellite imageries and uh, weather data and so forth, and enabling the decision makers, for example, uh, state government, central government, and bodies like banks, uh, to bring the data about the crop field, the stress, uh, the crop, even crop yield, on, to, uh, on the fingertip of the officer who could take and make decision about uh, if and how they can give insurance to the farmer. And we believe that this would not only uh, improve the access for the farmer to these instrumentation, but also would increase uh, the operations for the bank many, many fold, which will all further reduce the cost of insurance per farmer. So if, say, example, if you may be paying 100 rupees per month for insuring your farm, it may probably bring down by just the the virtue of scale to five dollars, uh, five rupees, and so forth. So that's what our focus uh, is on, and you know, we'll, you know, we'll talk, talk more today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so my first question for Shashank, Alvaro, and Rujit is: uh, you know, you're doing so much technologically for the farmers, but farmers are not tech-savvy people, and you know, most. A lot of others, including me, are not either. So, what do you? How do you package the technology so that you you penetrate the market? And, and how do you even figure out what the problems are? And uh, so, so what's the pre-process? And then also just penetrating the market. Yeah, sure. So. I think and that's just one second. And Sanjay, can you speak to speak to the macro? Like, what is the problem that uh, that innovators face when scaling, sure. and especially localization? Sure. So, thank you. I think that's a that's that's a very relevant question because uh, when we talk about small farmers, so I mean, so the reality is they do not have access, or they are not very much comfortable with the technology we are talking about. So, so in our case, basically, I mean, as I earlier you know mentioned that you know that. From where we had started, I mean, at that time there was no, you know, tech aspect to our work. The only objective was that how we can, you know, maximize profit per unit area of farmer, right? And in fact, then later on, with respect to time, when we understood the ground level reality, farmer psychology, then we started using technology so that we can now maximize the, you know, the sample size of our beneficiary. So, for example, a couple of examples of our uh, observation, uh, like. You know, in India, uh, the commodity exchange, uh, agri-commodity exchange, which was designed for farmers, but the reality is like 96% transaction being done by, you know, speculators, not by farmers, right? Uh, on the uh, advisory side or the training and capacity building side, each district of India has one, you know, Krishi Vigyan Kendra, but uh, we observed, we found that, you know, that there is very low footfall of farmer at those KVK, Krishi Vigyan Kendra. So then we started thinking on these lines that why it's happening. All these facilities or all these, you know, avenues are being designed and created for farmers, but still farmers are not using it. What's the reason? And the reality is, I mean, when you start thinking from a farmer's perspective, uh, from a small farmer's perspective, right? So the reality is their net income from agriculture in a year would be close to, you know, $1,000, right? When you calculate on a daily basis, 
then it will give you answers to most of your question that why they are not going 100 kilometer or 60 kilometer far from your village because their to and fro cost would be more than their daily income, right? So then we started thinking on these lines that, that what we can design which will be acceptable at farmer's end, right? And at the same time to make it, you know, long lasting, it, at the same time how we can also have a kind of, you know, sustainable angle so that we can, we can take this initiative to a much larger number, right? And that's what basically we did. So at our innovation, they had, I mean, we bring everything under one roof for small farmers and cost to them is close to $3 per farmer per year. In Indian con context, less than one rupee per day, right? And we bring everything under one roof, right? From agri inputs to market to information about existing government scheme, customized, you know, agri advisory and everything, right? And then revenue for revenue, basically we started looking from the industry side, right? If you, if you uh, talk about technology, so we also realize that that's fine, that this the hard technology we have designed, that's some primarily the mobile-based technology. But currently, according to our internal data, I mean, just 8% of Indian farmers have, you know, access to Android. So then we build this technology for the last mile service provider. So this technology, the hard currently is being used by the micro entrepreneurs. And, and it also solves another, you know, social issue that rural youth in India or, or, or underdeveloping countries, they're migrating to urban area, right, for, for a low profile job. So they, they are using our technology, they are working as a last mile service provider and while offering agri services to farmers, you know, they're also, you know, getting sustainable income, right. A lot of other things about the technology intervention, for example, we also found that usually in a typical, you know, training program to farmer, uh, most of the trainers, you know, give them a lot of information or usually training for the entire six months time. We, we realize that no, I mean, this, I mean, usually they do not, you know, digest all this information for next six months time, right? So then at our work, basically, we have broken down to small piece of information, right, on a weekly basis, on fortnightly basis, right? They are not comfortable in reading text messages on mobile phone, right? So it goes as a voice call in a local language, right? But they, they do understand numbers, right? So then we ask that, okay, you have done this, then press one. If you have, if you have not understood, then press two. So, so yes, there is a strong technology aspect, but, uh, but very much, you know, a lot of, you know, ground level realities and the behavioral aspect of farmers are the, you know, key component of our technology. So that's, kind that's our line of thought. I'll it's kind of a design yeah, to, yeah. to, to exactly. packaged in a way. Exactly. Yeah. You know, for us, it was, I'm a sales guy, and I learned a long time ago, you can't sell something to somebody unless you understand why they would want to use it. And uh, I had a mentor one time that told me, you know, take six no before you walk away. And that means that you got to ask the question of why would you not use this so you can overcome. And not being a farmer, I actually went to talk to, I spent seven months doing customer discovery, talking to 136 farmers. And when I understood what that problem was, I, there was another problem that emerged after my last conversation and spent another three months talking to truckers to try to figure out what their issues were. And um, through that, we were able to then decide, let's go and build something. And uh, what we found out doing it that way it was that we created trust with, with farmers. And that's a big deal. You've got to be able to trust because it's a relationship-driven business. Um, but that's, that's pretty much it for us. It was just go do your customer discovery. Don't, don't waste your time building something that you're going to have to go reiterate after your customer tells you it doesn't work. Well, I think we have only two minutes left for... I don't really have so okay. Go ahead. Again, uh, taking this uh, macro perspective uh, for our work, there are two uh, principal ways in which we have impact. One is in terms of playing a role in terms of the wider dissemination of existing innovations. And second thing is in terms of through the public policy perspective. Again, uh, on the best practices, I want to kind of quickly quote uh, another uh, uh, innovative company in the agriculture space in India. It's an organization called Digital Green. And the way they have the impact is uh, really interesting. Uh, uh, you, the, the individual entrepreneur organization goes to a rural area, identifies a successful farmer, within quotes, and goes about videotaping the farmer as he does his work, the seeds he uses, the fertilizers he uses, the irrigation method he uses. And the only intervention is, to make those videos available to farmers in surrounding villages. That simple intervention 
has been proven to be more effective in enhancing agricultural productivity than anything that the government has done or any of the multilateral agencies like the United Nations have done. Uh, so those uh, kind of simple innovations have done a lot uh, to increase productivity. Uh, Prime Minister Modi on downwards, they've talked about 10% uh, growth rate for the country. That growth rate would not be possible if the agriculture sector doesn't increase its productivity by at least a, a couple of percentage points. And these kind of organizations enable that productivity increase. Uh, the other point I want to mention is in terms of the public policy standpoint, uh, Amitabh Kant uh, is the uh, incoming CEO of this organization called Niti Aayog. It's the kind of the successor of the Planning Commission. He's one of the most influential bureaucrats in the Modi administration. He has been uh, the architect of the entrepreneurship policy. There's a whole contingent of Thai that went to India in January and helped uh, play a role in the formulation of the new entrepreneurship policy that was announced with the government. And we've been talking with Mr. Amitabh Khan in terms of having a social entrepreneurship policy uh, which focuses on sectors like uh, uh, education, healthcare, agriculture, and so forth. And some of the points uh, that we've been talking to him include very specific, tangible things that the government of India can do for the agri-entrepreneurs things in terms of how do you ensure that there is a minimum compensation for the farmer when the risk Sanjay, reward we are kind okay. of uh, just this one point and I'm going okay. to follow. Yeah, when the risk reward is not adequate, it leads to a lot of farmers leaving the profession. So through things like crop insurance, through things like enhanced market access, how do you enable that minimum compensation to be available to farmers and so forth? So we're working on these kind of points with the government to enable uh, things to happen in the agri sector. Thank you. So I know we are running out of time, but I'll make two points. Scaling a company is hard, and it's harder for BOP companies. Uh, so we did two things as a, as a company. One, instead of creating an offering to directly reach out to individual farmers, we are reaching out to banks, which are much, much lesser than 400 million farmers we may have in India. That's one pivot in terms of business offering we did. Second we are doing is we are building a consortium of underwriters, banks, uh, scientist community and uh, in India to jointly uh, create these offering and then pitch to the governments uh, because that mu that's much more easier. So we, we now have access to about 30,000 villages in India where we could move anything, uh, any product we may be creating in the future. So. Thank you, thank you. And I had, I, I thought I'd planned for an hour or, or <laughs> that, that was in the mind, that is just so fascinating, sorry, but uh, Thank you for your, for, for your information and the work you do. Thank you so much. Thank you.